Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first Retina UK information webinar. Uh, we will be hosting at least one webinar um, on a different topic each month. So we're really pleased to have Elena Piotta, a PhD student from Oxford University, join us today to talk about the really exciting work she's doing alongside Professor Robert McLaren. Her presentation will focus on gene therapy, CRISPR, uh, technology, including DNA and RNA base editing, and why this is relevant for Stargardt's disease. Retin UK are proud to be funding Elena's studentship in collaboration with the Macular Society. We're also joined today by Paula McGrath, our Director of Development, and Kate Arkell, our Research Development Manager, who will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. So there are a couple of ways that you can ask questions. You can either type it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens. These questions will be asked by the team uh, on your behalf. Alternatively, you can raise your hand by pressing the Alt and Y key if you're using a Windows computer or option and why if you're on a Mac. And we'll then ask you to unmute your microphone so you can ask the question in person. So please leave your, question, please leave your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. And as I say, we'll have them answered at the end. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as we possibly can. However, any questions we're not able to get to today, uh, we will be following those up over the next couple of weeks after Elena's back from her well-deserved break. So thank you again for joining us. And without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Elena. Ooh, hello, uh, one sec, I'll just start um, sharing my screen. Cool, well, thank you, Matt, for that warm introduction. Um, so as Matt said, um, uh, my name is Elena Piotr and I'm a first year uh, PhD student at the University of Oxford. Um, working on a project broadly titled Gene Editing for Stargardt's Disease. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to be funded by Retina UK. Um, and so yeah, again, as Matt said, I am working in Robert McLaren's lab. Um, and so yeah, so today I'll be talking about, um, first a brief background about myself, then um, I think there's a little bit of feedback. I'm sorry, I don't know. It, could everyone possibly mute, mute their microphones? Because I think that's um, where that might be coming through. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so I'll be giving a brief intro introduction about myself and sort of why I ended up um, where I am. Um, then a bit of a scientific background to make sure everyone is kind of on the same page because I don't really know everyone's backgrounds. Um, then I'll delve into the details of my project on DNA and RNA base editing and sort of wrap up with why this is relevant for Stargardt's disease. Um, and then I think, uh, as Matt mentioned, we'll be able to get into the Q&A. Um, so anyway, I'll get going then. Oops, is it working? No, there we go. Uh, here we go. So I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and kind of near San Francisco, California. Um, Salt Lake City here, you see on the left, is a pretty beautiful mountain, mountainous place um, that is known for things like skiing and other outdoors activities. Um, and then San Francisco, California is stunning and by the ocean um, and was definitely much more of a chill vibe to grow up in. Um, and so while I was living in California, I also did my undergrad there. Um, and I attended the University of California in Davis um, where I initially actually started doing um, a bachelor's in international relations because I wanted to kind of do more politics and public health, um, but kind of realized quite quickly that I really missed science. So then I also did a bachelor in disease biology. Um, and so here on the screen, you can see a photo of a cow, which might seem a little bit odd, but um, UC Davis is really known for agriculture. Um, and so this was kind of my first introduction to gene editing because they focus more on the, the agricultural elements of gene editing there. So in plants and cows and stuff like that to make sort of stronger crops and animals. Um, and so there was a really interesting discourse on sort of how like the ethics of gene editing and you know why you would or wouldn't want to do it in certain scenarios. And um, so yeah, it was quite interesting. And while I was there, I worked on a project in a protein engin engineering lab um, where we sort of switched, changed enzymes to see how these changes would affect the reactions that they processed, but then also to see if we could maybe manipulate those to either um, process reactions more efficiently 
people would just process new reactions altogether, um, which was quite far out, but that was the end goal. And so that lab is now like, instead of just doing enzyme kinetics, they have now sort of expanded to do that for gluten intolerances and stuff like that. So it did have eventual health applications. And so because of this research, I ended up pursuing a master's in molecular biology at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, so yeah, my mom is half German. So I ended up what I really wanted to, um, or my mom is German, I'm half German. And so I really wanted to go to, the, to Europe to study. And so here um, uh, for the master's, I ended up having to do uh, two research projects. Um, the first one was a biopesticides based project. So we were looking at compounds produced by soil bacteria um, to see, um, and, and these compounds tend to um, protect the plants that they live around. So they have this really nice symbiotic relationship. And so we wanted to see what these compounds were um, to see if we could, if it, eventually they could be mass produced for biopesticide purposes or even health purposes in humans. And um, I really, really loved the project. I thought it was very cool, um, but it wasn't really what I saw myself doing in the long run. Um, and so that, uh, so then my second project, I ended up at the University of Oxford, um, where I did my first CRISPR-Cas project um, with Robert McLaren, um, and really, really loved that, um, and ended up applying for a DPhil and coming back. And what really struck me is, like, I genuinely didn't know anything about eyes uh, going into that project, or eye disease, or really anything along those lines. I was just kind of interested in the gene therapy side of things, and very, very quickly became super fascinated by it. Just the eye is such an incredible, very complex organ um, that I still <laughs> struggle to understand sometimes. And um, just the, I didn't realize like how common I are, like inherited retinal degenerations are, all of these things were just like an incredibly interesting, steep learning curve. Um, and I also got to see a gene therapy surgery the first week I was there. And so it was amazing to see how translational the research was, you know, it was like the stuff being done in the lab was actually being done to help people. And so that was like just very powerful to see. Um, and so, yeah, I really kind of fell in love with it. Um, and so, yeah, now I am excited to be doing a DPhil with Professor McLaren, who you can see here on the right. Um, and then there's a nice picture of Oxford. Um, if you ever get a chance, I'd highly recommend vi visiting. It's super beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, so I've sort of started my project in October. Um, and so, yeah, I've almost done a year now. Um, so next I'll be going into the science part. So the first things first is what is a gene? So a gene is a region of a genome that codes information through a combination of molecules. And what you see here is this X sort of uh, in the corner and that is a uh, chromosome. So we have 23 pairs, 46 in total, and they're a super coiled DNA. And so a lot of people have probably heard uh, the term DNA thrown around. Um, so that's kind of what this string-like thing is that you see going across the screen. Um, so regions of that are what genes are basically. Um, we don't know what a lot of it does because um, not all of it codes for stuff, but the parts that we do know uh, that code for things are called genes. And these then get turned into protein. Um, and the protein is ultimately what allows us to catalyze reactions. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. And so the key elements of um, DNA are in this circle here. So you see G for guanine, C for cytosine, A for adenine, and T for thymine. And they always pair like that. So you always get a G to C or a C to G, and an A to T or T to A. And if it's any, in any other way, so for example, a G to an A or a G to a T, um, that would then be considered a mutation. And this is then what causes problems later on. So the, all of these so the necessary components here, um, you see this kind of like flow chart of um, the process. So you have kind of a horizontal ladder on the top um, and that is represents DNA. And so that's kind of this, um, uh, the base pairing that I just explained. So like the G's to C's and the A's to T's um, base paired here. And so the DNA is kind of like this incredibly detailed book. Um, and that will then get, transcribed into RNA, which is sort of this single stranded thing. So it's like if you cut a ladder in half, basically, um, immediately below. Um, and so this is kind of like a summary of a book, basically, It'd be like the abstract of a paper, or something like that. And that's all you would need to actually make the protein. And so the protein is then the end product. So the RNA gets translated into a protein. And so the protein 
because then what allows all of your cells to function as they do, process all the chemical reactions, all the things you would need, um, provide structure for cells, stuff like that. So then, and as you can imagine, if something goes wrong early on in this flow chart, so if you have a mutation in the DNA, then that mutation would then end up in the RNA and eventually cause an issue in the protein, possibly. I mean, not always, but often, yes. And so some of these changes that can occur that would have a negative effect on cell function, for example, would be if you have a mutation in the DNA that then causes the RNA to stop translating halfway through, and then you would only get half of a protein. Um, alternatively, you could have one that then for some reason will end up completely changing the structure of the protein, even if it's just one base change. Um, somehow that can just then cause a misfolding and then the protein won't be able to catalyze the, re the reaction or maybe catalyze it much more slowly. Um, or sometimes you don't get any protein at all. And so all of these are kind of different scenarios that can play out from different mutations in the DNA. Um, and then eventually this is what causes disease. Um, so one way, or I guess if we go back real quick, so you could address like trying to fix this in a number of different ways. So you could, a lot of, um, a lot of companies aim to do small molecules. So it's kind of like, I don't know, like ibuprofen or something like that would be an example that interferes in a process um, and would like up or down regulate something um, that you would need. Um, and so that won't typically, you know, do anything to the DNA or RNA. Um, alternatively, new things like gene therapy will try and sort of get around the whole DNA element. So what you see here in this picture is you see something that would be part of the sphere and then sort of the spider-like structure with this like squiggly line in the middle of it. And so the squiggles are the DNA, the spider-like structure is a viral vector, and then the round thing is the cell. Um, and so what you can, or yeah, what is often done now with gene therapy is um, that instead of taking, having the virus deliver its own DNA into a cell, you uh, take the gene that you want and you can put it in the viral capsid. And because viruses are so, so, they're like super evolved to find specific cells and want to deliver what they have in them into the cell, um, you can then take these viral particles and they will then deliver the gene that you want into the cell and it will then express that cell. And so viruses evolve this way because that's how they reproduce. So it's like if they deliver their own gene into the cell, then um, more viruses will be produced by that cell. So instead, you're producing the gene that you want um, by putting that gene into the viral particle. Um, and so this has been done a number of different times uh, quite recently um, within the last like 15 years. Uh, so it was first done uh, with, for Labor's congenital amaurosis and then recent or like slightly more recently, um, but also quite new um, in the UK with choroidremia. And the one for, for LCA, so Lux Turna, if any of you have heard of that, is the first FDA approved gene therapy. And um, so yeah, so it's very, very exciting. Um, so then the next thing is sort of why the eye. Um, the eye makes an exceptionally good target um, because it's very safe to access um, and then scientifically, it's quite nice because you have a natural control. So you can inject into one eye and then leave the other eye uninjected. Um, and you can measure within one, within the same person, how much they're benefiting from that. Um, and so it's quite nice because um, you can measure that quite clearly. Um, and then also the clinical, like, yeah, the end the outcome measures that you need um, can be measured um, without any invasive procedures. So you can do like a visual acuity test, or you could take images of the eye and stuff like that. Um, and it's a very well-developed surgery, so it's quite safe. Um, and so, and also like the virus that's used to deliver to the eye is very, very safe. It's not really, it's not pathogenic to people um, and elicits like an incredibly minimal immune response, if at all. Um, and so for Stargardt disease, this seems like it would be an amazing opportunity to deliver the gene. But with Stargardt, you do encounter the issue that AB, the ABCA4 gene is too big to fit in the viral particle because although AAV is very safe and incredible, it does have its limitations and that the capsid can only fit a gene of a certain size inside of it and it's not flexible. So you can't make it bigger, unfortunately. And so there's what you see here on the screen is a cat trying to squeeze into this very small box. And that's kind of what you're trying to do with ABC4 is trying to fit this huge gene into a very small viral particle. Um, 
And so a lot of research groups are focusing on trying to make this box bigger. Um, so for example, you could use a lentiviral vector, which has a much bigger carrying capacity, um, but that also has its issues. Or P groups are trying to work with nanoparticles um, where they're making their own carrier uh, vessels. So for example, this is being done with lipids. Um, there's also cool like gold or um, uh, other metal charged metal particles that would then be able to deliver to the cell. Alternatively, you can also try and change the cat. So um, one method of doing that would be um, splitting the gene in half. So you could, and then putting each half into a viral particle. So this is called a dual vector approach where you have half of the gene in one viral particle and the other half in a separate viral particle. And then these are both delivered to the eye and then the gene can combine in the cell. Um, this can also be done with proteins. And so this is very um, a very cool approach. And I think this just got taken up um, to start a clinical trial in the States. Um, so that's quite exciting. And so uh, for, for ABC4, which is quite nice. Um, alternatively, um, there's other things you could try to put into the viral particle. So just get an entirely new cat, for example. And so this is what brings me to CRISPR-Cas, which has kind of, you know, been a really big deal the last 10 to 15 years, or yeah, about 10 years now. Um, it was recently discovered by Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, um, or I guess 10 years ago now, and they, uh, but they just now won the Nobel Prize for it. So that, I guess, was the recent news with that. Um, and so what you see here is a giant black circle that represents the bacteria, and then a viral particle that is this red um, sort of uh, square thing um, attached onto it. And so initially CRISPR-Cas evolved as a bacterial defense mechanism against viruses, because um, believe it or not, viruses do attack bacteria, they're called bacteriophages. And similar to uh, viruses, they also replicate in that they inject their DNA into the bacteria, and then the bacteria start producing um, what that DNA says. And eventually it takes over um, the bacterial mechanisms and uh, just creates viruses. And eventually the bacteria will die. And so to sort of overcome this, they developed the system called the CRISPR-Cas system. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And Cas is a CRISPR-associated system. It's kind of a mouthful, so I'll just stick to CRISPR-Cas for now. Um, and so this system will basically be able to recognize uh, these viral sequences and chop them up. And the way it does that is that in the bacterial genome, you see these small sections of red are saved viral DNA sections that are from previous viral infections. And so the cast will recognize, like using these, recognize that a virus is attacking and be like, oh, I've seen this before. I can go find it. I'll chop it up. And then the viral DNA won't be produced basically or into protein. And then if it's a new infection that cuts it up, it will then save some of that to uh, mitigate any further infections. And so what Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier realized is that you could harness this to then, um, uh, yeah, to then basically target what you want. So before I continue, there's a couple of necessary components to uh, go through. So there's two kinds of Cas. There's Cas9 and Cas13, which I will get into more detail later. There's also a PAM site. And then uh, there's Cas's from different species. So the different species you get are based on the bacterial species they come from. So if I say like SP Cas, that means it comes from S pyogenes, um, which is a bacterial species. And this is relevant because the gene for these Cas9 species um, they're different sizes. And so I'll get into all this later, but before I like threw around all this jargon, I just wanted to touch on it briefly. So the way the CRISPR-Cas works for gene editing is what you have here is this blue sort of cloud shaped um, thing on the screen. And that is representing the Cas9 enzyme. And then this red line is the, RNA, the guide RNA. And so the Cas9 and the guide RNA will combine. Um, the, R the guide RNAs based on those um, viral snippets that the Cas recognizes in the bacteria. And so these targets that are the guides um, can be designed. So you can decide where you want it to target um, by making this guide. 
Um, and it will then sort of search the whole genome until it finds that guide and bind there. And to do that, that though, there has to be a very specific sequence nearby called the PAM site. Um, so it first finds the PAM and then the target uh, sequence adjacent to it. So this means that when you're trying to find a mutation to target, for example, that there has to be a PAM site nearby. Um, and so once it's bound um, with this guide RNA, it will then cut there. Um, it kind of just chops, similar to when it chopped up the viral DNA. And so then this renders that gene inactive um, and it won't work anymore. And so this seems like kind of an extreme measure, <laughs> um, I think initially. And this is just what CRISPR Cas sort of initially um, was designed to do uh, for in humans. And so this would be relevant. So there was a very cool study where um, mice infected people with HIV, they created a target that only could cut up um, a sequence that was only in you know, the HIV virus, for example. And then the, um, they basically like eradicated the viral, the HIV infection in the mice. Um, or alternatively for dominantly inherited diseases, you would then be able to target the mutant gene um, and then render it inactive so that when you then supply a gene supplementation therapy, only that one is expressed. So you don't get any more of the faulty protein, for example. So there were a lot of cool applications. It's also very useful in lab if you wanna see you know, like what a certain gene does or something like that. Um, so, but it obviously, yeah, has a lot of limitations. Um, so then uh, much more recently, um, base editing became a thing um, where um, various enzymes were fused to the Cas9 enzyme. And so this um, allowed you to, or allows you basically to just switch out one base um, and correct it if you want. Um, and unfortunately we can't just go in there with tweezers and switch it out as delightful as that would be. Um, and so, yeah, so this has had, you know, a massive effect on um, research in general. Um, it was recently used uh, in progeria, which causes rapid aging um, in vivo. So in mice that had progeria symptoms, they basically um, started uh, mitigating symptoms and um, had, I think, like 20 to 60 percent editing. So there's been a lot of very cool um, positive uh, research coming out of it. So before I delve into the depths of this, I'm gonna go over the necessary components again. So again, you have this uh, ladder DNA structure, um, which gets uh, transcribed to RNA, which gets translated into a protein. And so DNA-based editing focuses on editing um, just these single mutations in DNA. RNA-based editing focuses on um, doing the same thing in RNA. Um, and the base pairing, just to reiterate, is G to C and A to T and vice versa. Um, and so these are all great uh, points to target. So DNA base editing, the way it works is, again, you have this Cas9 cloud enzyme there. It uses a guide to find the target in the DNA. And it also requires this PAM sequence to be relatively near to the mutation. So here you can see there's an A. Um, uh, that is uh, just, for example, the mutant A. <laughs> Sorry, I get hiccups sometimes. <laughs> and um, so the guide will bind to the DNA um, after it's unwound. And then you see this brown cloud kind of down here beneath it. And this is then a deaminase enzyme. And that will allow this base to then be changed to a G. Um, and that is just a, um, a reaction that it mediates. So it's very cool because you can yeah, basically um, switch single uh, point mutations uh, to the correct base. Um, and so this was recently uh, done in vivo in mice um, to correct a uh, pathogenic mutation in RPE65. Um, and that had a 29% editing rate um, and no uh, side effects, which was quite exciting. RNA-based editing, on the other hand, it's very, very similar, but it edits RNA, um, but it does not require a PAM sequence, which means there's way less limitations on where in the, gene, in the, um, uh, the transcriptome you can edit. So um, you can basically edit anywhere. Um, that being said, it can only do uh, these specific changes. So here again, you have a mutant uh, base and it then edits it to the correct one. Um, and yeah, again, this is just fused to the Cas13. So 
as a therapy, this would look very, very similar to uh, a normal gene supplementation therapy in that you have a, a viral delivery mechanism because ultimately a cast is a protein, right? So then um, what would be delivered is a gene um, that is the cast gene though, that is then delivered into the cell and then the cell will express that gene and create the cast enzymes, which will then be able to target um, the, uh, the relevant mutation. Um, and so interestingly though, um, you do encounter some of the same issues that you would with ABCA4, for example, um, because some of the cast species, the gene is much, much too big. And so you would also have to try a dual vector approach or a nanoparticle approach or a lentiviral vector approach. Um, and so there's just a number of things to consider when trying to decide, do you want to do RNA or DNA based editing? Um, so for example, the PAM sequences, they can provide added specificity, for example. So it's kind of like an, a nice added safety really. Um, so it doesn't only have to find the target, but also has to find the PAM because there are instances where, you know, um, it can mistake an area that is quite similar to the target strand, the guide strand. Um, and bind to the wrong place. Um, and so this, the PAM sequence could be a benefit um, if it's um, on the flip side of also being a limitation. Um, the delivery to the cells is another thing to consider. So um, with DNA-based editing, a lot of the Cas9s are um, too large in size, um, whereas the Cas13 has now been shrunk down enough that it can fit in an AAV delivery system, which is the preferred method. Um, there are, however, cast species that are much smaller, um, that are just, you know, being discovered because the field is evolving so quickly, there's constantly new cast species coming out of it. Um, and on that note, there are even PAMless cast nines, which is quite cool. Um, the efficiency is a major one. Um, so a lot of the, like SP cast nine, um, which is unfortunately the largest gene for a cast species, um, is definitely has the highest editing efficiency. Um, so for a lot of different um, uh, diseases or um, mutations, it's unknown how much editing efficiency you would need to actually see a difference. Um, and so the higher the editing efficiency, generally the, the better that would be. Um, so if you could maybe get like an SP cast that was miraculously smaller um, and maintained the same editing efficiency, that would be pretty ideal. Um, and then uh, off target effects, that's a major one um, because that could be a cause for safety concern. Um, however, RNA editing is quite nice for that because it's only editing RNA, it won't be a permanent change because um, yeah, there's constantly RNA being produced from that like sort of blueprint gene. Um, whereas if you're editing the genome, that would be a permanent change. And so then you wouldn't be able to yeah, reverse it basically, which could, if it does, do the change in an incorrect position um, that could potentially be detrimental. Um, and then lastly, um, the length of the efficacy and whether you need to re-administer. Um, so with DNA base editing, because you're editing the genome, that would be a permanent change. So you'd ideally only be administering at once. Whereas RNA editing, we don't actually know how long it's effective for because um, <laughs> it's still very new. Um, and so, there's a chance that you would have to re-administer that. Similar with gene supplementation therapy, they're finding that around after one to three years of administration, you have to re-administer it to, to continue seeing those effects. Um, but yeah, so all of this is in early days and um, we're still trying to like figure out the, the safety for all of everything and how well it works and you know for how long it works. Um, but it's a very, very exciting uh, stage right now to be in. So this is very important, I think, in pathogenic um, human mutations, um, because uh, I think there's around 32,000 known pathogenic human mutations, if, if not more, but more to, that have been identified by now. Um, and of these, a total of 62% would be uh, editable with these uh, tools, the DNA and RNA-based editing, which is incredible. Um, and so this holds when you look at ABCA4 specifically. So 63% of the um, mutations are targetable with these methods. And consider like ABCA4 has around 1200 known mutations, which is insane for one gene. So the fact that 63% could be targetable is absolutely incredible. 
And so CRISPR is evolving super, super quickly. Um, so a lot of the limitations that I described, um, such as the off-target effects, though that's you know going down. Um, the PAM sites are becoming much more flexible, um, and the sizes of the genes that need to be delivered are you know changing very rapidly. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. Um, so yeah, it's a very uh, cool field to be in. And so I guess the goal of my project is to compare and figure out which would be best for ABCA4. Would DNA editing be better or RNA-based editing be better? Um, and so yeah, it's, it's quite exciting to figure, try and figure that out. Um, so I'd like to thank my group um, here in the center is Robert McLaren. Um, and then also thank you to Retina UK. I uh, recently did a run with them or for them, uh, the um, one of these ultra challenges and raised some money because they're just an incredible um, organization. So yeah, uh, thank you for your time. Elena, thank you so much. Um, I'm Kate Arkell, Research Development Manager at Retin UK. And um, I'd just like to thank Elena for a fantastic talk, for explaining some really difficult stuff really, really well. Um, as Elena said, she's only in the first year of her PhD. And so, um, and unfortunately because of the pandemic, she hasn't had much of an opportunity or any opportunity really to meet our community face to face. So we really appreciate you Elena taking the plunge and, and doing an online event for us. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, um, and this is actually our first webinar too. So, so thank you very, very much. Um, just a reminder to say, um, if you would like to ask a question, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can raise your hand um, or um, you can type something in the um, Q&A box. Um, if you raise your hand, I, Paula and I will give you permission to unmute and then you can put your question directly um, to Elena. So, um, we've had a couple of questions already um, in the question and answer box. Um, one of them is from Sherry, Elena, and she says, I'm from San Francisco Bay Area too. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> thank you so much for working on Stargardt. I have a mild form um, of Stargardt. Genetic testing found that I only have one copy of the ABCA4 mutation, or only, only one of her copies of gene is mutated. Would any of these gene editing therapies still help someone like me? And do you feel there really will be a cure in the near future? Oh gosh, I feel like that's a very difficult question. Yeah. Um, I feel like I, I need to um, preface the, the Q&A with, I, I don't really have a clinical background. Um, so I don't know um, anything about that, but yeah, I think a timeline for this is quite difficult to establish, um, just given how long uh, clinical trials take. Um, I mean, there is a clinical trial with CRISPR for, um, I think also Labor's congenital amaurosis happening in the US that just started about a year ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I guess it's hard to say exactly whether it can help um, because we're still working out the extent to which it could help the DNA and RNA based editing in cells in lab. Um, but once we get some results for that, I will report back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, you're very wise, Elena, to not <laughs> put a timeline on it because um, in the past we've, we've seen people try to put a timeline on these things and it, and it then inevitably ends up being disappointing. But I mean, I, I feel hateful that there are lots of avenues being explored for Stargardt's and, and I, I feel hateful that one of them will come good, hopefully, in the not too distant future. Um, in terms of your, um, Sherry says thank you, Elena. Um, <laughs> in terms of your question about only having one copy, that is hard for, for both me and Elena to answer in that neither of us are, are clinicians. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit more difficult. So I'm sorry, we can't give you a, a complete answer on that one. Um, we've got a hand up um, from Lertzan, um, but I think you've written your questions as well in the question and answer. Um, I'm just gonna read those out first. Um, and if I cover everything you wanted to ask um, Lertzan, then you can just lower your hand. Um, my Daughter has one intronic mutation. 
that is outside protein coding exons in ABCA4. Can this be treated? Is that a matter of Elena? Does it matter where the mutation is if it's the if it's the right mutation for the gene editing tools to target? Yeah. So that yeah, that's actually a great question. So for that, I could I can answer. <laughs> so um, in that case, you would only be able to use DNA based editing because when you have so a gene will include both exons and introns. Um, whereas the RNA will just be a, a transcription of only the exonic regions. So the introns are cut out. Um, and so if you have an intronic um, mutation, you would only be able to use DNA-based editing. Um, but because it gets cut out, it's very, it's quite safe. It's like a much safer, I think, approach. Um, because if it accidentally edits something around that, it might not really have an effect. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that that does make sense. Um, yeah, so if you had a mixture, so let's say saying her daughter has one intronic mutation and one extronic, um, so presumably you'd have to pick DNA editing, I guess, to target both of those. Can you, when you have different mutations, is that is that really too much of a challenge at the moment or? Um, so it's because it's typically, um, I mean, like the vast majority of the time it's uh, recessive, you would only have to edit one of the mutations. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's kind of what we're actually looking into now in like databases is trying to figure out, you know, how many of the mutations likely have a nearby PAM site, um, for example. Um, and so it's kind of nice almost when they're different because then if you only have to edit one at least, because then you would um, if one of them, for example, is a, a mutation that you can't edit, whereas the other one you could, then you would only have to edit that one. And so it yeah. almost increases the targeting options. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, again, that is like, you know, because as, as Sherry was saying, you know, she has mild symptoms and only has one uh, mutant copy of the gene. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it seems yeah. like it's kind of a toss up. Um, but you would ideally be able to correct one and then not have it anymore. Yeah, that's, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that's really helpful. And even if you could just improve the situation and not completely yeah. uh, halt the degeneration, that would still be a, a fantastic um, yeah. step step forward. Yeah, sorry, I'm just putting a jacket on. That's okay. <laughs> Getting a little cold. <laughs> Elena, um, I d I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer this question. Um, maybe together we can, or I can try and sort of, say um let sans also asked do you think if she says if if we go for stem cell injection will that be a showstopper for gene editing um i wonder if that means if you had um if you took part in a stem cell clinical trial because these are going on at the moment um there's a couple i think one might even be considering oxford as a trial site i'm not sure uh i think it got approved for oxford because i think uh, robert actually recently did a surgery for that i, th yeah. I think so. i think you're right i think um so potentially would that be a showstopper for gene editing i think that means if you had that treatment would that prevent you potentially for having gene editing i don't expect you to necessarily know the answer to that Ooh, yeah i don't know um yeah, I'd, uh, I think there's always a, a case for gene therapy. Uh, yeah, because it would just be a single administration and then it would hopefully be fixed. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I guess, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think if you, if you, sometimes if you take part in a clinical trial, it's always worth asking if the treatment that you're having or any treatment that you have might preclude you from having other types of treatment in future. That's always um, a good mm -hmm. question to ask. In terms of generally the two, the two different treatments would, would, will the development of one overtake the development of the other, if that's what you meant? Um, I'm not sure because I think I don't think they will because I think they have different applications and they'll be appropriate for different people in different situations. So, so no. Um, Nicola says um, sixty. You mentioned sixty-three percent targetable mutations. Would that include retinitis pigmentosa or is that completely different? 
I think what you meant, Elena, was that generally in the genome, about 63% of mutations are targetable. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. They're, they're the kind of mutations that would be targetable, targetable because so basically the, the enzyme that's fused to CAS, the different CASs, they're, um, they can only mediate uh, specific reactions. So um, they can also, for example, they would only be able to fix G to A mutations. Um, and so, uh, um, and C to T mutations. Uh, so that, in, that totals to 63% uh, in the entire genome. And you find that that trend is reflected in, in ABCA4, that 62% of the mutations that tend to exist in the gene um, that we know of at least are, um, are these kinds of mutations. But that, that's the thing is like, the number of mutations in ABCA4 just keeps going up, <laughs> it seems like, <laughs> um, as, as, we, as we sequence more and more people um, that we know of at least, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess that 63% is kind of reflected potentially in other genes as well. So if you had retinal degeneration caused by a completely different gene, that 63% mm -hmm. might be roughly, roughly yeah. reflected in that as well. So yeah, yeah. probably, uh, I think it, it probably, I think it's quite dependent on the gene. Um, okay. And I think, I think it's reflected in ABCA4 so nicely because there's so many mutations, if that makes sense. Yeah. That, because there's such a huge sample that that would then correspond. Um, so yeah, but then, you know, a lot of mutations are far more common than others. Um, so yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, sorry that we can't give a sort of precise answer to your question, Nicola, but um, I think, yeah, very dependent on the individual gene, which mm -hmm. kind of leads on to um, another question we've got um, from somebody who says, um, thanks for an amazing presentation. Um, I have a big picture quest question that may relate to the targetable mutations slide. With so many mutations, how can it ever be efficient to try and address stargards through gene editing? Wouldn't different testing be required for every situation? Um, I, I can kind of help you with, with that yeah. one. <laughs> Yeah so, yeah, no, yeah, so basically um, when, you, when you have a genetic test, um, everybody, for example, 100 people with Stargardt's go for a genetic test, they all have the same genetic test. And that test identifies, um, will identify the mutation, the exact mutation involved. So your complete genetic test result should give you enough detail that you know not only that you have definitely got a mutation in ABCA4, but also where that mutation is and the nature of that mutation. Um, and so you would then know, or um, somebody would like Elena, I wouldn't know, but Elena would know uh, probably if that mutation was something that her CAS system, her CRISPR-Cas system could potentially target. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, and I and on that, uh, yeah, yeah, you are very, uh, very right. Uh, it does take so you'd have to individually test um, each guide, for example, to make sure that it actually works, because even though, like you know, hypothetically, a specific PAM site with a specific guide sequence should work, sometimes it doesn't, and a completely like a slightly different PAM, even though it's not. The, the designated one that you would think should work, works better. Um, so yeah, those would have to be tested individually. Um, so then, you know, like, yeah, it, it seems like it would make more sense to just create a larger vessel to deliver ABCA4 if there's so many known mutations. Um, I guess the advantage of wanting to, to do base editing is that if, if you could get it to work perfectly, um, you would only have to administer it once and it would be curative. So if you, uh, hypothetically, so if you administered it early enough, you could really prevent degeneration from happening down the line. Whereas with something like gene supplementation, you would have to re-administer every couple of years. And it is a fair, like, it's not a super invasive process, but it's still something where you have to get, you know, a subretinal injection every three years. Um, and so, yeah, that's just kind of something to consider. Um, and if, you know, like, for example, like, you know, 10% of the German population has, uh, of Stargardt patients with, have a specific mutation. 
you know, if you got one of those guides to work, then, you know, you can help 10% of Stargard patients in Germany for like with DNA based editing, which, yeah. yeah so it's kind of, it, it is a, a weird numbers game, especially with something like ABCA4 where there's a ton of mutations. Um, but I think, you know, as you do it more and more and more, you get better at um, designing the guides and testing them more efficiently and then being able to administer them. Um, mm. Yeah, that makes absolute yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, no, that that completely does make sense. And and I think it, it brings me on to say there are all of these avenues are so worth exploring, you know, it's absolutely worth Elena busying herself, um, you know, exploring this whole gene editing approach, because it may work out that that's the best answer for some situations. And it may be that in future, we come up with another solution that's better for some other situations. Um, and there's absolute value in absolutely all of those. Um, does anybody else have any further questions? I'm just looking down the list to see if we have any hands raised, but I don't think we do. Um, I'll just give people a couple more seconds. We do have a comment, Elena, from um, somebody just really expressing their gratitude, saying you can't even imagine how much hope you've raised. Um, God bless. So um, just oh. really, yeah. Um, very grateful. And yeah, that was an excellent talk. So if nobody else has got any other questions, um, Matt, would you just like to wrap up and perhaps give people details of uh, the next the next webinar? Absolutely. Uh, a huge, huge thank you, Elena, for such a fantastic presentation. Um, this research could open up a host of um, new opportunities for treatments within within the IRD community. Um, and thank you to all of you who've joined us today for our first webinar. Um, I hope we can all uh, agree it's been a great success. Um, so over the next couple of months, we have a number of other online events planned. Um, so I'll give you a couple of dates now and um, tell you how you can come and join us for these. So the first one being Thursday, the 23rd of September, we are joined by um, Rolly McGall with a presentation titled Inflammation and Retinal Degeneration in Retinitis Pigmentosa. Can lessons learned in the lab help us identify treatments in the clinic, which sounds really intriguing. Uh, Wednesday, the 29th of September, we have um, a longer information event. This is a two hour long uh, information event. Um, which is um, designed specifically for people within Northern Ireland, although a lot of the information contained within that will be, um, will be pertinent to, to anybody within the IRD community. Uh, Wednesday the 13th of October, we have a similar event for people in Wales. And finally, we have Wednesday the 27th of October, uh, we'll be joined by uh, Michael Gilhooley with a fascinating presentation on optogenetics. So we'll be sending out an email over the next uh, couple of days, which have got details um, of where you can rewatch or listen to Elena's presentation today uh, and details of how you can book onto the other events if you wish to. Uh, we'll also be seeking your feedback on um, today's sessions, which we, we value all feedback. Um, so it helps us to develop our webinars with this one being our first one uh, and our other services. So once again, thank you to Elena. And thank you to everybody else. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. That was great. Thank you, Elena.